good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you all for being here. We realize uh, that it's midterms week for many of our uh, undergraduate students and maybe for many of our graduate students as well. And so taking the time this afternoon is very much appreciated. And my name is Irfan Nuruddin. I'm a professor in the School of Foreign Service and director of the Georgetown University India Initiative. Uh, we are very fortunate this afternoon to have the opportunity to help launch a very important new report from the World Bank on making politics work for development. I should note that this event is uh, co-sponsored by various uh, entities here at uh, the School of Foreign Service, including the Global Human Development Program, the Masters of Science in Foreign Service Program, the Asian Studies, the Center for Latin American Studies Program, and the African Studies Program. So it's a very pan-SFS uh, effort to make this possible. And of course, it's only possible because we have uh, Stuthi Kemani, a senior economist in the development research group at the World Bank, uh, willing to come uh, to Georgetown today to help present this report to you. Uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna try and keep this as efficient in time as possible to respect your schedules. The idea is that Stuthi will present her report over the next 10 to 15 minutes. We have then invited uh, Dean Joel Hellman from the School of Foreign Service who has come to Georgetown after a long and distinguished career at the World Bank uh, to offer some comments along with a couple of our other faculty colleagues, Monica Aruda from the Center for Latin American Studies, James Habiramina from McCourt School of Public Policy, and myself. And then hopefully there'll be time for Q&A before we move into a reception that I hope you can stick around for. So you can ask Tuthi your own questions, maybe purchase a copy of her book and have her sign it for you. Anything that really makes her blush and embarrassed by all the attention that she has so richly earned. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce to you Dr. Stuthi Kemani of the World Bank. Please welcome her. Thank you so much, Irfan, for those uh, generous uh, introduction, uh, and to you and to Georgetown for organizing this event that allows us to share this new report that was produced by the bank's research division, and to all of you for coming. Uh, let me start with an example to set the stage about the problem being addressed in the report, and we can refer back to this example to illustrate the messages of the report throughout this presentation. So this example is drawn from a documentary film that was made in India, and it tells the story of the city of Kanpur, uh, which was once regarded as the Manchester of the East because of its thriving industry. Now it is without electricity and industry, which has fled in the face of lack of public services and 16 hours of power cuts a day. The uh, eponymous protagonist of this film is uh, a citizen who is called a Katyabaz, which is Hindi for one who steals electricity and makes illegal connections for household from the state uh, public grid. Uh, and footage in the film describes, shows how citizens think about this theft from the state as justifiable, in contrast to theft in general, which is considered immoral. The second protagonist is this public official uh, who heads the state electricity company, is reform-minded, and wants to galvanize her and manage her, uh, her utility company to improve the situation, to, to clamp down on illegal connections, collect revenues, and actually provide electricity to the city. Uh, and these people that she has to manage within her organization are actually, the Katyabaz alleges that they collude in theft from the state and that he learned his trade from these frontline providers of the state electric utility. The third protagonist is a local leader, a politician, who uses and exploits this situation to come into office. He successfully acts to remove the reforming leader from, from her position, and she's transferred to a backwater position. Uh, and after coming into, and he successfully paints himself as a savior of the poor and the weak, wins the local election. And upon coming into office, subsequently, he's the subject of much controversy and uh, with allegations of being one of the famous criminal politicians uh, of India. And the city remains dark and decayed. Uh, so what this example illustrates is the problem of politics that the report tackles as a fundamental problem of governance, 
uh, defines the notion of government failure, which is when the leaders who wield power within government knowingly and deliberately ignore sound technical evidence or are unable to implement good policies despite good intentions. So we abstract from what are good policies in any sector, in education or health, etc., and we focus on adverse political incentives among leaders to not uh, pay attention to technical merit of policies, uh, not to debate policies on the basis of technical evidence, uh, but rather the opposite. And on, the, on perverse behavioral norms, not just among political leaders, but also among public officials and citizens, as in this example we started with, uh, to, to have attitudes towards the state and the public sector that are detrimental to good service delivery and provision of public goods. So the report uh, discusses at some length the example of corruption as government failure, uh, but it also goes beyond corruption and discusses government failure as arising from distributive conflict among citizens and ideological beliefs among citizens that prevent them from finding common ground. And we'll come back to this a little bit. Uh, then what the report focuses on is how can we harness two forces that are emergent around the world to address government failure. So we did this work now because these forces are, are emergent and because we have an accumulating body of research to draw upon, to distill lessons. So one is citizen engagement, particularly in the political realm, where citizens are increasingly participating in selecting and sanctioning these leaders who wield power in government, including very importantly by entering themselves as contenders for leadership. And second, transparency, which is citizen access to publicly available information about the actions of those in government and the consequences of these actions. So space for citizens to participate not only as voters, but also as contenders has expanded throughout the world. The first panel, the top panel here, shows it using data from the Polity 4 initiative, which classifies countries according to their level of democracy versus autocracy. And what this picture is showing is that the distribution of countries has you know, regularly shifted upwards through different waves of measurement under the Polity 4 initiative. So even if an individual country might have backtracked or stagnated, uh, the distribution has shown this secular shift towards greater space for political engagement. And what the second panel shows is one example from the country of Uganda of several case studies in the report about how within countries with very different national political systems, even if the national political space is closed, there's uh, quite, quite a bit of space at the local level. So in this example in Uganda, direct elections for district level leadership in Uganda has created space for many contenders for, leaders, for leadership to emerge. Uh, and so in, in, in the modal number of districts, there are three or more candidates competing to be the district mayor. And competition for this position is tight with votes skewed to, uh, uh, to less than 50%. There's, uh, we draw upon other kinds of public opinion surveys to document citizens' interest in participating as voters, particularly the poor or less educated in the poor regions. Uh, other types of responses from public opinion surveys which show how citizens have high expectations from elections. Uh, and then in, in, in the world of transparency, in the force of transparency, how citizens have access to multiple uh, types of media. Um, and how uh, this graph is showing how transparency and political engagement, where transparency here is being measured using Freedom House's measure of press freedom, media freedom, go together. So uh, countries that have higher scores on the Polity 4 index, which Polity 4 measures as higher democracy, also tend to have greater media freedom as measured by Freedom House. But what is also striking in this picture is for any given level of autocracy or uh, as measured by the Polity 4 initiative, there's quite a bit of variation in media freedom. So information and communication technologies is allowing for a dynamic media market to flourish and is creating what some have described and the report discusses as a dictator's dilemma, where these technologies are needed for growth, so dictators are loath to shut them off, but then once they are in place, they lower the costs of citizens to access information 
communicate with one another and mobilize. Uh, the same public opinion surveys which show citizen interest in elections also show that the thirst of citizens for information to evaluate and assess their leaders, including, again, citizens who are measured as being food insecure or less uh, educated. This is a picture from the website of Reporters Without Borders, where they color code countries according to the degree of, uh, of press freedom. And what's interesting and surprising about the variation this kind of a picture documents is the continent of Africa doesn't look that different from the rest of the world. Uh, in contrast to when you color code Africa and contrast it to the rest of the world on human development indicators. So there are several countries on, in the African continent uh, that actually rank at the highest levels of press freedom. Uh, and there are several that rank better than the countries like the United States, India, or Mexico. Uh, and it's not, so what, what, the, what press freedom uh, across the world and uh, citizen access to diverse media suggests is governments are not the only sources of information about government policies and actions. Investigative journalism is, present, is, is generating information and civil society and international development partners are also. And, certainly under regimes of open data, this kind of information and data created by multiple parties is increasingly available in the pub public realm. So we, we pull together highly dispersed pieces of research, forge connections between them to distill the following messages. First, that political engagement, which is the selection and sanctioning of leaders, is the key to both understanding and solving government failures. Second, that transparency can support healthy political engagement in order to overcome government failures. And in contrast, transparency initiatives that are targeted at apolitical citizen engagement are unlikely to be effective. Third, uh, building effective government institutions requires changes in political behavior. Investments in formal capacity and innovative technologies are not enough. And political engagement and transparency can work together to bring about the changes needed in political behavior. So let's take the first message. So this is really the importance of political engagement is really the single thread we pull out from a very complex web of political economy research. And then we weave this thread all the way to implications for policy actors and for future research. And this is not about democracies versus autocracies. We examine the research about variation in economic performance across and within countries with very different political institutions, both categorized as democracies or as, auto or as autocracies or in between. Uh, and we show how this research uh, leads to the conclusion that the question of how how leaders are selected and sanctioned is one that applies to each of these broad institutional uh, contexts. Uh, you can have democracies which yield popular, populist demagogues that pander to citizen demand for private benefits at the expense of broad public goods. Uh, or you can have democracies with accountable leaders who are delivering broad public services, such as public health, which is an example I'll come to in a moment. And you can have Within autocracies, you can have uh, sort of developmental statesmen, but you can also have disastrous uh, dictators. And which of the end of this spectrum autoc autocratic institutions fall under uh, really depends on how the organized elite citizens who who wield the power of selecting and sanctioning leaders, whether those organized elites are able to punish bad performance by badly performing <coughs> leaders. Uh, so the, the way we distill this thread of political engagement is also by showing that political engagement matters not only for the incentives and behavior of political or elected leaders, but it casts a long shadow on governance, shaping the incentives and behavior of mid-level bureaucrats, frontline providers, and citizens themselves. Again, think back to the example that we began with. Uh, so there are at least three mechanisms through which political engagement matters uh, for governance as a whole. 
It matters through the incentives of leaders and how they manage the various myriad working level day-to-day -day agencies of government, whether staff are rewarded for good performance or conversely uh, appointed through nepotism or political patronage and career concerns, similarly whether they depend on performance versus patronage. Uh, Political engagement casts this long shadow also through the selection of different types of leaders. Leader identity matters, and we document the research on that. Motivation and, uh, of leaders matters. Uh, and then the role of leaders in shaping behavioral norms through whether they have legitimacy for public goods or not uh, uh, shapes also the values and attitudes of public officials and citizens towards the public sector. Again, think back to that uh, first example we started with. Um, let me give one example of sort of reduced form effects of how political engagement can have healthy and unhealthy effects within the same country and institutional context. So this is an example from some research I did in the Philippines and uh, using Afrobarometer survey data for a number of countries in Africa, where we found this really robust correlation between vote buying and service, health service delivery, and health outcomes among poor children. And the correlation was that in places where you have greater politics of vote buying at election time, in between elections and during a term in office, the leaders invest lower levels of public spending on health. And as a consequence of that, uh, the children from poor deciles families that depend upon public services are likely to be, uh, have worse health outcomes. The mirror image of this uh, are some results from the work of Thomas Fujiwara in Brazil, where he exploits the presence of, of a reform, of an electoral reform, which used technology to lower the costs of poor and illiterate voters to be able to cast their, their ballot. And, uh, and he shows how this reform both led to more effective enfranchisement of poor voters, lowering of whether their ballots were confiscated because they were irregular. And that effective enfranchisement, in contrast to the disenfranchisement that happens through the vote buying example in the previous slide, is correlated with better health outcomes and greater spending on public health. So you can have these two very different types of uh, consequences for governance and service delivery of the same underlying process of political engagement depending upon what is the platform of contestation. The second message is based on a review of a large body of evidence which shows that across a variety of contexts, political engagement of citizens is highly sensitive and responsive to the availability of information. Second, that the role of mass media in particular seems to be a powerful one to amplify the role of political engagement. And third, and here there's less evidence and we highlight it in the report as an important future area of work uh, that uh, and sort of use uh, more qualitative uh, evidence to show that media could also directly influence political behavioral norms, how people think others are behaving towards the public sector and therefore shaping their own behavior. So just a quick example on the responsiveness of political engagement to transparency. Uh, there's really nice work that uh, that's some researchers have done in Sierra Leone. And since this is debate season, I thought this was a good example to share. Political debates in Sierra Leone are incredibly well attended uh, and really matter for how voters shape their voting decision and what the MPs that are elected after being subject to political debates do while they are in office. And so this is a context, you know, which has a country which has come out of civil war, which has poverty, the ep Ebola epidemic, so I mean, it's the but and but nevertheless, it's a context in which the political engagement of citizens is highly responsive to transparency. Uh, the 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 related point we make. Uh, by reviewing the literature on the impacts or not of transparency is transparency that is targeted at apolitical citizen engagement, 
sort of within the business of engaging citizens to take over certain service delivery responsibilities or to uh, exert social pressure on frontline providers like teachers and doctors. Uh, the, the body of research suggests that these initiatives, their success or failure really depends upon the broader political uh, incentive environment. Uh, so you, you, again, you can see it in the context of this framework picture of the different principal agent problems uh, uh, that, are, that is analyzed uh, in the report uh, that when it comes to within government problems of management, uh, certainly well-intentioned leaders could use uh, very different types of transparency and apolitical citizen engagement to solve their within government management problems. But whether they have the political will to take up the right design on the basis of technical evidence or what would work, what would not, and whether even when they take up these policies, whether the frontline providers and the citizens would indeed act as intended by those policies, all of that depends upon the nature of political engagement. And the third uh, message was about how building effective governance institutions really requires changes in political uh, behavior. Uh, in, it simply investing in capacity building or transplanting institutions from the rich to the poor world, uh, there's a quite rich evidence which suggests that does not work or is not sufficient. Uh, and at the same time that uh, you, what is needed is homegrown institutional change that evolves endogenously and accounts of historical processes of transition from weak to strong institutions suggest that the confluence of political engagement and transparency can provide those tipping points for that endogenous change to occur. Let me try to just put these messages uh, uh, in a different perspective. So let's start with a simple proposition that transparency and citizen engagement impact really depends on what people do with it. So the hope is that there will be all of these well-intentioned citizens out there who will come together for organized group-based collective actions such, uh, such as in civil society organizations, and they will undertake actions for the broader public good. Similarly, that within government, there are well-intentioned reform leaders, both among politicians and among bureaucrats. And these and your transparency or engagement policies that external actors invest in will allow us to harness the energies of these well-intentioned actors. But the problem is politics, because there is another form of collective action, uh, which was analyzed as special interest capture very early on in the literature focusing on the United States, uh, actually, uh, which can thwart collective action for the public good. And this is collective action that special interests undertake for private or club goods that can come at the expense of the broader public good. And these special interests can be extremely savvy about how they use the political processes uh, which, and harness what individual citizens are doing th through political institutions uh, so that they can get their leaders who watch out for their interests into office. So reform leaders can lose office because citizens are mobilized to support non-reform leaders on the basis of caste identity or vote buying or other targeted benefits. But this is not just a problem of vote buying or casteism in poor countries. Populist demands from ordinary citizens for private benefits can be exploited by leaders who nurture ideological constituencies and polarize people rather than find common ground for public goods. So there are examples of this kind of pernicious politics from everywhere in the world. So what to take away, uh, what we say you can take away from the evidence in this report is an understanding of citizen behavior and using that understanding to craft policy strategies to shift citizen behavior towards the public good. I'm not gonna read out from this table, I'm just pointing it out here as this is table 0.2 in the overview of the report, which summarizes the lessons within this framework from the citizen's perspective or what type of actions can they take and how do we uh, distill the messages from research about when do these actions move towards the public good. But here are the policy implications. Agnostic and generalized transparency is not going to be enough. Uh, we, we, dis we use that thread of 
how political engagement is fundamental to governance to say that transparency needs to be targeted to improve the quality of political engagement and the design of these transparency initiatives matters. It has to be information, content that deals with performance and consequences of policy actions rather than policy actions alone. So for example, not budget transparency alone, but what, budget what budgets deliver in terms of service delivery outcomes. And it's not just information content that matters, but how it is communicated. So using persuasive mass media and packaging information content in appealing and entertaining ways is, uh, is, is a factor. And third, that both of these things, the communication and the content, uh, have to be made congruent with the levels at which citizens are actively engaged in selecting and sanctioning leaders. So the congruence between media markets and political markets matter. Um, we also have implications for how do you design this non-political citizen engagement, taking political behavior into account. And finally, we discuss how there are entry points for implementing the lessons of the report at the local level, the so-called last mile of service delivery within countries with very different national political systems. But let me... So, move to the end uh, by saying none of this is easy or simple. Um, uh, clearly, transparency can, can nurture unhealthy political engagement as well. Uh, and our messages so far are optimistic about the potential of targeting transparency to improve the quality of political engagement. But you could have, you can, I'm sure you can all think about many examples where media plays just the opposite role in nourishing unhealthy political engagement. But the point that we make in the report is that even, even if so, even if unhealthy political engagement persists, there is no sidestepping it. The solution to the problem lies through it uh, rather than trying to, to bypass it. And again, on the optimistic note, from uh, what it, for developing countries, uh, what we are learning from institutional transition in the rich world is that the confluence of these two forces provide uh, points for endogenous homegrown change, similar to what happened in this country during the progressive era. Uh, so to end uh, with, the, the overall message is to take communication to citizens seriously, not as a soft option, and that these kinds of targeted transparency policies are really a, a necessary complement to everything else that policy actors do. Second, we've chosen to focus on transparency in a global environment where transparency has is, potential has become elevated due to the vigorous forces of political engagement that are underway. Uh, but much more future work is needed on design of institutions, especially in a world where the power to select and sanction leaders is becoming so diffused among citizens, the sweaty masses, if you will. And finally, the other uh, message that comes out is one of overall approach to development, to reduce the hubris of external actors uh, from one of knowing the right policy answers in every setting uh, to one of trying to create the enabling environments for countries to find homegrown solutions. Uh, so one area of hubris, which we do uh, are guilty of ourselves, is that uh, uh, leveraging the comparative advantage of external actors in analyzing big data and extracting meaningful information out of it. Uh, and finally, all of these approaches, the diagnosis of the problem, we think applies everywhere. This is not just a development issue, but it includes rich countries and transcends national boundaries. Uh, and uh, we think the lens that we are providing in the report may be helpful for policy actors in the rich world as well. So I'll stop there. Let me start by thanking uh, Stuti for a very clear overview of a report that should be pretty evident uh, from both her presentation, but also if you take a moment to flip through the bibliography, is absolutely comprehensive. Uh, the amount of research summarized and uh, digested in this report is quite remarkable. For anyone looking for a quick deep dive into the, what we know about policy engagement in the policy process, political engagement in the policy process, there's no better starting point. We have a very distinguished panel over here, which brings to bear 
both real world and academic expertise on the questions raised by this report. We're gonna start with uh, Dean Hellman, who, as I mentioned earlier, played a very active role in the World Bank for almost 15 years before coming to Georgetown. Uh, after he has a chance to offer a few thoughts, uh, Professor Almeida will speak, uh, and then uh, Professor Habir Amina. The idea here is really to provoke conversation. This is too thick and big a report uh, for us to offer anything resembling a fair critique or engagement, but really more to offer thoughts maybe for how it jives with our understanding of how the bank works and how politics and development work in the parts of the world we know best. But maybe with Joel, if I may also suggest, if you could uh, maybe offer your thoughts from having sat at the World Bank and sort of thinking, especially with the bank's annual meetings coming up, about how this sort of plays out in day-to-day -day life in the development community, that might be a really interesting perspective, so. Well, uh, thank you very much, and it's, it's great to be here. I must say, after 15 years at the World Bank and now being at Georgetown for a year, I'm free to say whatever I think <laughs> um, about any World Bank report, but I'm particularly pleased to say what I think about this report and what Studi has done. Studi looks like a mild-mannered, um, uh, research-focused, extremely pleasant and engaging um, the, deliberative, but in fact, she's a revolutionary. Um, because the truth is, literally five years ago, you could not have done this report um, at the World Bank, even as, 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 as early as five years ago. I don't think you could have produced this report. Now, the cynical side of you might sort of say, well, sort of a thousand years after Aristotle and Plato, the World Bank has finally figured out that politics matters. <laughs> um, but um, it is important to recognize how difficult it is to get a full and frank and thorough discussion of politics um, into the, the, the Bretton Woods institutions in particular, those institutions that were created explicitly with an apolitical mandate, um, essentially to dispense technical assistance and capital. Um, and to say that even after 50 years of that, of that work, a recognition of the limitations of what you can do without a full understanding of politics um, is still, um, unfortunately, um, a radical notion in, in a large swath of the official development institutions. Um, so I think it's, it's critical what Suti is doing is, is really pushing the agenda forward. Um, and she's doing it in, 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 in a wonderful way, which is, is, is engaging in dialogue on political issues in a way that can bring together the disparate shareholders and clients of the World Bank together to talk about these issues. Um, the downside, the difficulty of doing that is that I think that in order to talk about politics in a place like the World Bank, you have to depoliticize politics. You have to make politics seem like a technical exercise, that a variant of a big data challenge. Um, it's about not the nature of a regime, um, but it's about the way in which a regime implements various processes and functions. So politics um, becomes sort of shorn of the what Martin Amish used to call the piss and vinegar of life, um, which is all about what, what politics is often generally and most excitingly and most interestingly about. But politics becomes, um, to some extent, a set of underlying processes um, of participation, engagement, um, a transparency, and the way those things interact. And I think where the most interesting thing about the report is this, the word that um, the suit uses congruence and trying to understand the congruence between different forms um, of transparency and participation um, and countries' overall levels of, of, of political openness and engagement. Um, so I think that you do have to talk about, in order to bring politics into this realm and arena, the last remaining realm and arena which politics is in there, you do have to talk about politics and engage in politics in a certain way, which I think ultimately does limit you. I think, and I'll, the, the point I want to leave this on is I think what it leaves out are two very important um, parts of the spectrum of politics. Um, and the way I think about it is if you think about the continuum of low income and developing countries from the fragile and failed and conflict affected states on the one end to the most advanced states on the other, what Stuti's work is most interesting for is for all the countries in the middle. 
Um, all the countries which can see marginal improvements by changes in the techniques and functions of transparency and engagement. I think there there's real um, significant marginal improvements that can be made through the, um, the, the lessons that Stuti is summarizing. Where I think it becomes less helpful and where I think we just know less and Stuti is summarizing an enormous amount of literature and I think the literature is less rich is on the low end of the, of the fragile failed states where the issue of political order is more important um, than, and there's certain, a certain threshold effect of political order that's required um, before countries can actually begin um, the road and the path to development. And I think we know very, very little about that establishment of political order and the maintenance of political order, the, the, the recreation of political order when it doesn't exist. And I, I don't think that the transparency and engagement dynamic really helps us very much in that part of the spectrum. And then finally, on the most advanced part of the spectrum, um, including in our own country in the United States, but not only in the United States, um, we do seem to be at a, at a pivot point in which um, the level of transparency and engagement um, has to some extent even undermined the very quality of data um, and expertise in the, in the public dialogue. So that marshalling evidence, marshalling data, um, uh, bringing in different groups and, and trends, even in a very open and competitive system, seems to have some way undermined the very value of some of those tools um, in the open debate. And that's not only true in the United States, we have an extreme version of it in this election, um, but I think you're actually seeing it more and more in other um, and the more advanced developing countries as well, where that whole nature of the openness of the system has led to some extent to a denigration of some of the values um, of information, um, um, of, of expertise and engagement in the, in the political dialogue, which is having an impact on choices, um, significant economic and political choices. So I'll leave it at that, but I congratulate Stuti um, on her revolutionary views um, and hope that she has sort of success in, in, in trying, trying to get it understood and engaged it operationally at the World Bank. Thank you, Joel. Uh, Monica? Um, uh, thanks for inviting me for the event. It's a pleasure being here. And I, I just uh, want to talk a few things with Stuti because, uh, and I think I've, I addressed a few things uh, with you earlier, is that, you know, that it was a pleasure for me to read the book. And, uh, f and I thought, I think it's very helpful in the sense that it, it does a nice uh, review of, of the literature, not only the theoretical one, but the ones that focus on case studies. And, uh, and, it, and, and, and she really... Uh, uh, not analyzes and, and tries uh, to make sense of all the work, uh, that sample of work that, that's out there for everybody. And, um, and I told her that I'm actually already using some of her findings in my own class. And uh, so it's really help, it's helping me uh, communicate with students some of the, of the, of the things that have been produced um, uh, so far. Uh, the other thing, I, I, as I was reading the book and I, and I, and I understand the focus on transparency and, and the political engagement, and it clearly states that these are necessary but not, not sufficient, right, in order to uh, uh, achieve uh, gov uh, bureaucratic, bureaucratic efficiency, right? And, um, and I can think of many cases where this is so true. Uh, and for example, you know, we have all this push for transparency and I know that in Mexico, um, you ha they had, um, in an attempt to uh, deal with the, the problem of cronyism, they actually, they're, like here in the US, you know, if you have government employees, they post the information about the, 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 the employee and the position and the amount of money that they make, their salaries, right? And um, so I was meeting a few years ago with a group of students from Monterey in, in Mexico, and they were saying to me that, uh, you have, it's a very problematic thing to do this in Mexico because you have the organized crime who just goes to this government pages and they look at information, the name and the person, how much the money they make, and they use that information for kidnapping and ransom. And they, and they target the amount of ransom based on the salary of the, the worker. So it just, you know, like it's, and, and you see how people would be very uncomfortable having this, their information uh, published available because it's a matter of security for them, right? And, 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 but on the other hand, you, you want to deal with the cronyism and you want to deal with the clientelism that exists there, but you know, what, what, how, how do you solve that problem, right? Because it's a, that information is being badly used. And so that's one example. Another one in terms of um, 
the, the political engagement, and I'm going to bring the case of Brazil. And I think that over 30 years of uh, democratic uh, uh, regimes, uh, we had, I, I don't think that people would uh, argue that there is, a, there is a, uh, that political engagement in Brazil has been successful in the sense that you have very low threshold for parties to form, people can engage in political system fairly easy. Uh, you have uh, over, in Congress, for example, you have over 30 parties being represented. Right, but uh, so the access to political participation is there. The problem is the quality of, of the, these newcomers, and uh, and it's really poor. And even in in uh, parties that have a very strong grassroots uh, uh, movement and and, and access, uh, it's very hard uh, to get uh, people of good quality. Right, and uh, and uh, remember during the the the. the in many interviews that uh, our former president Dilma Rousseff gave in order to justify what was going on in her government and in, in earlier government of, of Lula. And she said that, no, pretty much you govern with what you have, right? And I'm meaning trying to dis uh, excuse uh, corruption and, um, and, and the low level of, of competency among uh, uh, su supporters who, uh, helped them in the elections, right? Because that's, that's something that's a given. You know, when you run an election, you win an election, you're gonna give government jobs for those who, su who supported you during that election. And, and the, the challenge for me then is like how to improve the quality of these this folks, right? Of not only the ones that are running for, for public office, but the ones that are gonna serve in, the administration, in those administrations. And, uh, and I think that uh, in many cases you have this concern to open up the political system, but the, the idea and the effort of trying to give capacity and, and even to recruit people with comp competency to work in public office has been something that's been um, uh, secondary, you know, left to a second plan at least for now. And I, I, I wonder, um, if at the, at the bank level there have been uh, efforts to try to uh, um, improve, uh, because you just don't want to bring, you're not con concerned not only with quantity, but you're concerned with the quality of people who are coming to public office to serve. And is, is there any um, uh, uh, initiatives that uh, address that particular side of politics, right? So these are the, the things that Thank I you. Wanna... James? Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation, and uh, I, I would like to point out that I'm, I'm doing some work with Stuti, Stuti on, on this very issue. Uh, but I want to start by agreeing with Joe that in some ways, uh, you know, it, this is a really, really surprising uh, sort of publication from the World Bank, which in some ways has, uh, I think as Joe has pointed out, has been very careful in, in, in discussing politics openly, and in fact, in, in saying that, you know, some of the key impediments to to poverty eradication and development are really essentially kind of about the politics. So, so I, I certainly hope that Stuti's insurgency uh, will, in fact, be be successful. Um, and 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 and, and I, you know, the, the, I think the other good, the other, uh, I guess, major reason I'm really happy that this publication is out is, I think, in the last few years, uh, you know, publications, you know, books like Why Nations Fail, I think, have painted a very different picture about, in some ways, the the the, the possibilities uh, for politics and, and, I guess, development to sort of come together and, and, and produce the, uh, you know, the, the better equilibrium. Uh, that, that in general, in some ways, you, know, you could read Why Nations Fail as sort of saying, look, if the economic opportunities don't produce and support the interest groups in ways that can balance essentially kind of uh, these, you know, the distribution of power in, in, in a society, that we, in some ways, we're doomed, right? In, in that, you know, in the absence of that, and in some ways, I would like to, I guess, vouch most of my, uh, my reactions to this book in, in, in that way, which is to say, well, transparency is a great thing. Elections are, are great things. There is a big move in decentralization that has produced, I guess, a, a much, I guess, more uh, visceral experience of, of governance at the local level. So in some ways, people have a much better sense of what it means to be governed even down in the rural areas, very far away from, from, uh, from capital cities. 
Uh, and all of those things in principle should produce at least the, the, the mechanics and, and, and the ingredients for a much better engagement. But on the other hand, I think the, the, you know, the iron law of oligarchy, to sort of to, 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 to take a phrase from why nations fail, also means that you know, the people who produce information uh, and, and the interest groups in some ways who will want to uh, engage with this information in these environments, they, are, you know, they, they may not always act in, in the way that I think we, you know, this book actually would like us to believe uh, will act, which is to say that there, there isn't one form of information. In some ways, when we think about transparency, there's many ways to say, well, we'll open our books. Every country has now an open data policy in which they say, well, you know, our, our data is available for all. But none, you know, in some ways, and I, this is going back to, I think, Studi's point about, you know, producing information that is actionable, uh, producing information that in some ways citizens can use in ways to actually sort of hold their leaders uh, to, to, to account. That, that in some ways I think has been uh, something missing from many years of you know, democracy and governance interventions either done by the World Bank or done by USAID and other actors. Um, and, and, and so I think this, it is refreshing to actually think, and, I, and it's not obvious you know, how this information should be produced. I think that's in some ways, I think from a research perspective, and I may, uh, I may be a little bit uh, uh, yeah, play, playing to essentially kind of the things that I kind of think and worry about, that it's, not, it's unclear if you had information about ed the education system in any environment, uh, and, and, and most education systems are failing abysmally in, in, in a lot of countries, you know, what information you would generate to actually get people to say, we want better services. So in, in some ways, we, we have to understand the production function well enough to say, how do we raise money, taxes, and, and how does that money translate into essentially a, a good school or a, a child who has competencies in, 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 in something. And I think there, because of the ambiguity associated with that, I guess, causal path between what is the relevant information and what is actionable uh, information to a citizen, I think there's always going to be room for uh, actors to, to to fight over, in some ways, whether this information that's being generated is, in fact, uh, is in fact uh, legitimate. And, and to give you some example, I mean, so, I, you know, I've suddenly, I, I, my, 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 my immediate research over the last few years has not been directly in these things, even though I think I have, you know, we, we've done, uh, a few colleagues and I here at Georgetown have done some uh, citizen engagement type uh, evaluations where we looked at a TV show that was uh, funded by donors and, and had a lot of very positive characters demanding good government from, uh, from their local political leaders and actually sort of trying to see whether, you know, one season, so about 13 episodes of exposure of, of this kind of, 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 of media. And I think that, in some ways, I actually think that's probably a, a, a more creative way of actually uh, providing information to, to individuals, or at least encouragement to, to, to act. Uh, has any effect on, on their beliefs, and, 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 and you know, and I think like a lot of other studies, it was a, it was a, it was a pretty big zero uh, that you know there was no effect in essentially kind of the way people behaved, and ultimately uh, you know, but but I think the challenge in some ways is to actually think about what is the right information. So the, those studies don't work. There, there are other studies by other people that I found to be quite convincing, and and for me the the test for whether this study in fact has identified the right information is how the elites and, and the leaders respond to the, 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 the availability of that information. And so there was a study about five years ago that uh, provided information about parliamentarians' behavior in, 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 in Uganda. Uh, and, and, and the information was an NGO produced this information. It collected information how many times the parliamentarian spoke, how many times the, the parliamentarian was absent. That NGO was shut down. The parliamentarian stood up and said, you know, the, the, the methodology is being used here is wrong. Uh, and, and, and we don't want to, you know, and we essentially kind of don't believe it, and we dismiss the report that was actually released. And, and for me, that's an indication that, in fact, we've actually produced the right information. But the moment that the, that the elites who can hide behind the numbers, can hide behind the fact that the production function is really complicated. Nobody knows how to generate good education, good health. You know, we have a lot of money, but, you know, and, and, and we, have, we have money. It's never enough, right? Uh, and so I, I think, I think uh, that ambiguity in some ways is, is in some ways where I hope that this research can push to actually say, can we exploit the big data? Can we do something to actually sort of produce actionable information? And, and can we get around the fact that 
you know, in, in a lot of these environments, the elites are going to try and take ownership of a lot of the technology and the organizations that produce information. Uh, th th this is going to be the new game, but in some ways I think that would be moving the, the ball down the field. Uh, and I th so I, I welcome this report and I certainly hope we can uh, get, get, get more good, good studies generated uh, and, and interventions in particular uh, sort of informed by this report. Thank you. Uh, a couple of thoughts from me before we open it up a little bit in the time that we have left. Uh, Stuti, congratulations. It's a remarkable uh, achievement on the part of you and your team. As everyone has noted, I mean, this is a bit of a radical uh, step. I remember actually an early conversation with Joel where he made a joke that he might not remember. Joel's title at the bank at the end was as chief institutional economist. And as I recall you saying that's because the bank couldn't, come, couldn't bring itself to have a chief political scientist and so needed to create the title of institutional economist uh, instead. Uh, I think, you know, for all of that, we say this, I think, with a real recognition that the bank, of course, is very much constrained. The reason that it can't engage in politics is because the people that it has to deal with, its stakeholders, are in fact the very political elites that in a very subversive way, we're trying to create political institutions to hold in check, right? So you're asking, in essence, uh, for, for those of us who would like a more radical perspective, I think, have to come to grips with the reality that uh, the World Bank is dealing with the very stakeholders that it itself is trying to incentivize to do the right thing. This is not an easy, easy problem. So I want to invite you to come back to Kanpur, right? I mean, in the sense of, to circle back in the end. In some sense, I think India strikes me as a very difficult uh, case for, your, for the optimism of this report. One thing that's very striking about this report and about your presentation of it is sort of the note of optimism, right? That we can, in fact, hack our way uh, again, building on something Joel said, you know, that we can find technical solutions uh, to very difficult political problems. And yet India is a country with a, I would argue, a pretty vibrant uh, democracy, extremely competitive elections, tremendous alternation in power, a very uh, noisy uh, and uh, exuberant media, right, uh, with all the limitations of some of the dangerous reporters that are not government censorship as much as they might be in other parts of the world. As James said, an open data law in the, in the form of a Right to Information Act, and yet we have Kanpur, right? So uh, how, would we, how would you reconcile those facts? I mean, what in some sense, does India represent the limits of a political engagement strategy? I mean, where, or, or what lessons can we draw? And maybe with that, you can then comment on anything we, else you'd like to say before we turn to our audience. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, all the thoughts and feedback that have been shared uh, on this very distinguished panel. Um, uh, so if you want me to begin with the Kanpur example, uh, I, think, uh, I think that example, the reason I began with it is because it fits the nuanced messages of the report so well, that you can have uh, uh, de jure and de facto institutions of media, transparency, political engagement, and still go down to the wrong equilibrium of unhealthy political engagement. And I think the, the, the message that I, th I was repeating towards the end is you, you can't find solutions for that that don't go through it. So in some ways, you have to improve the political process that, is, uh, that, that Kanpur goes through. Uh, what are some ideas for how do you move from that unhealthy form to the healthy forms? And I think, and again, I, Kanpur in particular, I would love to visit and see and sort of maybe even test out some of these ideas. But part of the story in the report based on sort of more historical long view research is that the endogenous changes come about through time, not maybe as rapidly as we would like to see or that we could immediately use as an example. Uh, but uh, what this research would argue is that those endogenous processes are underway. Uh, and they may not culminate in healthier engagement, but that is the only way in which it can happen. So there, by, the, it is by no means a simple message. And at the same time, as you pointed out, uh, we do try to be optimistic, mainly to be pragmatic. So what is it? Our mandate is to distill messages from research for policy actors to do something with. Uh, and I think we've identified a rich variety of things, a range of policy actors, from 
reformist leaders in country governments to international development organizations like my, the one that I sit in, as well as domestic and international civil society. They're, it informs a, a variety of different initiatives that this range of policy actors could undertake. With that, let me segue to uh, Dean Hellman's uh, uh, very nice comment about the spectrum of societies and how perhaps the report's lessons apply are most applicable to the middle band where some incremental change is possible. So I would like to be a little more ambitious and again optimistic and offer two ways of thinking about the application of this report to even the lower end of the band, to the fragile uh, context. Uh, societies that are at risk of uh, going into conflict but, uh, and are fragile but have not yet descended into conflict. Uh, the notions of legitimacy and creating trust between citizens and leaders that some of the research covered in the report, uh, uh, the insights that come out of that apply to, these, uh, uh, to, to nation building and state building in fragile contexts as well. Uh, but it's more than uh, in engaging citizens to do so-called community-based development and managing public funds themselves. Uh, the role of local elections and how leaders come about uh, is something that the, the research ha has grown in and which is what we review, but these notions have not yet seeped through in the policy dialogue in how we approach nation building and state building in fragile contexts. And to go to the upper end of the spectrum, uh, in advanced economies with strong institutions to check corruption, as, as Dean Hellman very eloquently described, uh, you know, and uh, James, Professor Habi Arimana picked up on, uh, we are in a, in these contexts, it's a world which is, sort of, I think the word is post-truth, um, where what is true doesn't matter anymore. Uh, and I think here we do have a section in the report where we talk about higher order transparency. So it is not simply media and current events and sort of civic education of voting age adults, uh, but higher order transparency which gets at sort of education at the school level. So implications for debate and discussion and school curriculum around what is the nature of a public good? What is the nature of the role of the state and government in overcoming, addressing market failures and persistent inequality? Uh, I think those are some of the policy directions, ideas for which come out in the report that apply to the upper end of the, of the spectrum as well. Um, on, uh, on your comments on the dark side of transparency, again, I think uh, uh, we document several examples along those lines of how, you know, for example, and I think your Mexico example is very well taken. Uh, the, one of the sort of celebrated examples in the research literature is a tragic one of how radio was used to facilitate the Rwandan uh, genocide. Um, I, I think that those kinds of examples are in fact what lend credence to this insight that it's not generalized transparency about everything, but really what James was calling actionable transparency, uh, what, we, what, theore what comes out very clearly in theoretical economics research on the importance of the consequences of policy actions. To get at what Professor Habiarimana was saying about uh, you know, there's so much going on in the business of government. What type of information do you provide that would prevent the politicians from obfuscating that information and pointing fingers elsewhere? We're never going to reach the ideal in that, but there are certain directions to pursue to approach the information content about consequences of policy action. On your question about recruitment of qualified people to the public sector, so in a sense, this is the bread and butter of the World Bank and other donor organizations to build capacity, to help in recruitment, civil service reform. And what we are saying is all of these bread and butter activities, uh, uh, while needed in approximate sense, fail to have impact because they are not sufficiently cognizant of political behavior and informal norms of behavior. So one example from your own country or Brazil that we have a box on on one of the chapters is precisely on how a reformist governor of the state of Ceará used a very innovative recruitment drive uh, of basic health workers uh, and used the recruitment to 
energize those who didn't get the job of the basic cadre of health workers to monitor those who got it. But how that example, this is Judith Tendler's work in Brazil, how she, in her, in her uh, uh, qualitative evidence on this, she describes that simply that recruitment strategy would not have worked had it not been complemented with a, so a, a radio blitz of information about the importance of what these health workers were going to provide. Uh, the basic vaccination programs to reduce child mortality, the linking it to the death of children, or, and, uh, which made it such an evocative message, and how that transformed the politics of, of, uh, of, of mayorships at the local level in Brazil, and therefore created incentives for the mayors to allow these newly recruited health workers to function in their areas. Um, I, th I should perhaps stop here yeah. to get some. Uh, so actually, you know, let me uh, change tack a little bit. I want to actually pose one last question to uh, Dean Hellman. And then instead of uh, Q&A, we'll allow that to be even formal over reception because we're uh, out of time. So Joel, as you know, we've got 20 of our students going as part of a SFS delegation uh, to the bank's annual meetings this weekend. Right? A pretty a remarkable opportunity. Many of them are in the uh, room today. Where, I won't put this to Stuthi because you know, she still works at the bank, but you said you can speak to this. If they were to observe and to see politics in action, where, does, where is politics at something like the bank annual meetings? Right? I mean, where does this, in, behind closed doors, I mean, where are these sort of conversations most relevant to making politics work for development occurring uh, at a place when all of the bank is focused here in Washington, D.C. for one concentrated burst, right? Where is this happening? I mean, my, my first cheeky answer would be it'd be happening behind the scenes, preventing reports like Stuti's to get out. <laughs> um, in the sense that really where the, where the politics does go on is representatives of countries um, addressing kind of what they see are sort of threats. Um, um, and, and threats in which the, let, let's say that, that the perceived conventional wisdom supported by institutions like the World Bank might lead to domestic problems to their own you know, political activities. That, 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 the, the, the ability to try to shape the dialogue of the World Bank so that it is not creating political risks um, for the key shareholders is, is really where the most intense and mm -hmm. obvious politics go. Um, it's been fascinating to watch the, the World Bank as an institution try to deal with the recognition, even if it was never as open as, as inform, and, and formal as it is in Stuti's report, I think the recognition which goes back much longer that ultimately everything they do has to be done with an understanding of the political context and ramifications and how do you formalize that into a process by which you design and implement projects and investments. And I think that there's been a long term, I would say well over a decade of effort, to think about the politics of what the bank actually does. Um, it, and, and it may be a water project, it may be a roads project, it may be something that looks technical, but the recognition is that things that look technical often have an intensely political dimension, both in their design and in their implementation, and in, if they are going to be successful. And the question is, could you bring an understanding of politics into the process in order to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of projects? So I think it was politics as a handmaid into effectiveness of project design. And I think there, there's been a long effort to try to bring in politics into the project of design, discussion, and debate about projects that has actually not been terribly successful. Um, because it, for, for two reasons. One, because it is very difficult to bring the complexity and nuance and sophistication of understanding of politics into essentially a bureaucratic process of designing and improving uh, and, and approving and implementing projects. Um, and second of all, there was always a veto power over the most sensitive and any sensitive issues by the clients themselves, saying anything that really, and getting a James's example, anything that really threatened them, they, they are the clients, they're borrowing the money, they're engaging with the project so they can stop anything that they find mm. ultimately threatening. So as soon as you got to the interesting stuff, that's where they wanted to hold back. So there was a, there was a, a, a kind of a stalemate of a recognition that politics is important, but a very sharp limitation to how that can be done. And finally, I would sort of say, and this gets to places like Georgetown and our thinking in Georgetown, is that 
the political science community as a whole. I was a trained political scientist in the World Bank. I once gave a lecture talking about that, and I called it In the Belly of the Beast. <laughs> um, that there, there were very few political scientists or economists with, a politi with, a, with an understanding of politics in the, in, the, in the staffing structure of the place, right? Um, and I think that hasn't changed. There's not a great deal of expertise, but I will say that the nature of political science research at the moment in, in modern academia is not terribly conducive to producing the kind of actionable knowledge that you're trying to do if you're trying to figure out if, if a water project or a roads project or, or even a, a, a macroeconomic set of policy guidance is going to work. That, that our understanding of politics is, doesn't have that kind of subtlety mm. and sophistication and, and contextualization um, in the way that it might have had uh, maybe in a previous era. Um, so it's interesting that on both sides are not really ready to truly integrate politics into the development mm. business. Partly it's from the political science side, and partly it's from the nature of the political um, engagement at the World Bank. Uh, so may I just follow up on this? So despite being with, uh, an employee of the World Bank, I have a fellow revolutionary in Shanta Devarajan, and he and I have co-authored a working paper building upon the PRR, which tackles this question front on. What do development actors like the bank do, or what has been the, uh, our experience uh, uh, in, through history in supporting countries with development assistance. And I think we critique what uh, Dean Hellman was describing, this approach of uh, which, we, which we actually, uh, part of when I said reduce the hubris of external actors, it was now when we take politics on board, we really go the other extreme of thinking, not only do we know the economics of the right technical policies, but we can also somehow navigate the politics and sort of solve the problem uh, in an, in a, in a really overarching sense. And what Shanta and I point out in this paper, and I think some copies are out there on the, on the table out there, uh, is that that approach has shown to be very highly unsuccessful. And so uh, quite a radical, another revolutionary proposal in that paper is to de-link the financing of development from the transfer of knowledge. Not go the project route, write the check, which some front office in the World Bank is already saying we will be writing to the countries in one form or the other, based on their international exposure or their CPIA ratings and so on. Uh, and then can go on with the business of giving technical advice, not just to the leaders of the countries, but also, according to this report, directly to the citizens following those uh, different uh, uh, criteria of information content, mode of communication, and congruence with political markets. Uh, and, and I would like to push back on something that Professor Nuruddin mentioned, and I think came up in Dean Hellman's uh, discussion as well, about somehow, you know, this is a technical fix to a highly complex political problem, and unless you get in the piss and the vinegar of politics, you won't, I love that phrase, you won't get anywhere. I think the case we are making in the report, as well as in this paper with Shanta, is that precisely because we are technical actors and we are meant to be apolitical, according to our articles of agreement, uh, that lends us a certain credibility. Uh, it, I mean, to put it very simply, we are external to the political equilibrium problem. So it goes back to Professor Habiari Mana's uh, sort of point about, you know, uh, where do you begin the chicken and the egg problem, the, the iron law of oligarchy? Well, perhaps where you begin are leveraging the power of external agencies that have the comparative advantage of producing uh, information content and in a way that's credible precisely because it's supposed to be apolitical. Well, that's a great note on which you end. I mean, I like to think, and I know that my colleagues will agree, that we are training at Georgetown, you know, generations of students who have both country area expertise and that technical knowledge, many of whom I will imagine will find their way to the bank uh, to work. So with luck, we can help solve these very uh, difficult problems. Thank you all for uh, coming. Thank you to the panelists for being here. Uh, revolutionary work is important. It's also very, it induces thirst. And so we have a reception for you outside. I'm sure Stuthi will be happy to answer more detailed questions that any of you have. Please come and say hello to her. Thank you again. <laughs>